Welcome to 10 Minute University. I'm Priscilla Robinson, and today I'll be sharing some information and hopefully inspiration for your vegetable gardening. With these webinars, we hope to help you master your garden. For a complete lineup, please visit our Clackamas Master Gardener website. Today's class is a 10 Minute University presentation from the Clackamas County Master Gardeners in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. Please stay tuned to the chat box as Sean posts links and the resources. And should you have a question, please enter that in the Q&A box where Cheryl, my co-host, will monitor the questions, answer some of them, and then we'll answer some live following the presentation. We hope you enjoy today's introduction to vegetable gardening. Here are some of the topics we're going to cover today. Determine the size and location of the garden. Identify tools needed for gardening tasks. Determine which vegetables to grow in the space. Develop and enrich knowledge for soil preparation, planting, care, maintenance, and harvesting. With some planning and science-based guidance, we help to help your gardening skills to improve and achieve better harvests. So what's your motivation? Are you itching to bring structure to your garden or implement crop rotation? Do you want to learn about and utilize gardening practices like row covers to extend your growing season and maybe keep some of those pests out? Is your vision a vegetable garden that is tranquil, a place to share with your family? Are you eager for a hands-on opportunity to pass on knowledge to, of gardening to the next generation? What are you thinking about? Are you looking for new varieties of delicious fresh veggies for your family? Get the most out of your growing space? Are you willing to lend a hand and contribute some of your produce to your local food bank. These are all good reasons to hone your skills and gardening practice with a web webinar like this. Whether this is going to be your first vegetable garden or you're looking to improve on last year's harvest, motivation is what will sustain you and your garden this year. My hope is to help you be successful, whatever your vegetable gardening experience is. So here's step one, determine the location and size of your garden. Vegetables need six to eight hours of sunlight. During this time, they are absorbing energy from the sun, CO2 from the air, water and nutrients from the soil, not enough sunlight will weaken your crops no matter how much care you give them. To find the best location, observe the movements of the sun and shadows in your yard. Identify where the vegetables will get the most sun. The amount of sunny space in your yard will be a limiting factor for your garden. The other limiting factor is time to, that you have to work in that garden each week. If your goal is to supplement your trips to the market, you may want to increase your current garden space. But keep in mind, you can raise those vegetables anywhere in the ground, raised beds, or even some containers. For each 100 square feet of garden, plan to spend four to six hours in the garden working. That includes 40 minutes of planting and cultivation and just checking out the, the garden and 30 minutes per watering session. So you might wanna start small. A 10 by 10 foot plot is perfect for beginners. 
It's estimated that a 30 by 30 foot plot will yield fresh veggies for a family of four. Containers are an option and they're ideal on your deck, patio, or tight spaces. A well-tended small garden produces more than a large neglected garden. An east-west layout is ideal. Be mindful of shadows being cast by trees, fences, and buildings, but that's the way to go. Then place your tallest plants on the north side of the garden bed to give all the plants an opportunity to so soak up that precious energy from the sun. Sometimes the orientation of the bed will be dictated by the space you have to grow in it. In the picture on the left, my daughter and son-in-law designed and built planters behind the garage where they had a nice 10 by 20 foot piece of unused property. The north-south orientation worked out well enough to give over six hours of sunlight and the elevated planters overcame the shadows cast by fences and buildings. The cage structure keeps out the neighborhood cats and sometimes the squirrels. In the picture on the right, my community garden is laid out in a nice east-west orientation. The taller plants on trellises or in cages are set on the north side to allow for maximum sunlight exposure on the south side. Step two, identify tools needed for gardening tasks. I love gardening tools. And when I moved to a condo a few years ago, it meant moving my vegetable garden into a community garden plot. My tools changed, but my love of gardening didn't. My new garden was a raised five by 10 uh, garden. My first years, I used simple hand tools and a watering can. And as my skills and goals grew, so did my collection of gardening tools. The following year, I put in a soaker hose with a timer to ensure I had consistent watering. And that became a time saver. So you know what I did with my extra time? I rented another garden bed. <laughs> there's no doubt that there's always another tool that you will do a better job or make the task a little easier. But don't let that be a limiting factor as you begin this journey. Start with the basics and build as your skills do. Keep your motivation and vision moving forward. For big jobs, I find eager helping hands and a game plan are the best tools to start with. Then I get busy. Some of these big tools are utilized at both the beginning and the end of the growing season to loosen and prep soil. The above photos show a lawn area being transformed into a raised bed. A raised bed is any garden bed that is raised six inches or more and is connected to the native soil. Using a shovel is the first step to strip off the grass and digging, and then a digging or a broad fork really help to loosen up that native soil. A hoe and a cultivator can work out the clumps in the soil with some good elbow grease. Then perhaps some compost or raised bed soil could be added to the native soil. Lastly, rake it smooth out, rake it out smooth, and then your garden bed is prepped for growing. More details on raised beds will be available next week at on, on our webinar. Smaller jobs need the right tools too. Hand trowels shown in the top two pictures can help dig holes, use to transfer a, a young plant, or to even put a seed in the ground. Watering and weeding ensures that your plants are getting the nutrients and space to grow. Whether it is watering with a hose or a timed irrigation system, the consistent deep root delivery of water is crucial. And the first 30 days after planting seeds is critical for weeding. 
seedlings are not going to compete very well with weeds. As far as weeding tools, I really like to use my Hori Hori to dig out those tough weeds. If weeding near tender seedlings, use tools with caution so you don't disturb the developing root system of that baby plant. Tools help to protect plants when harvesting. Harvesting it is an exciting time in the garden. Use scissors to snip out greens instead of pinching them with your fingernails. Use a pruner to gently cut the stem of the squash from the plant. By using the proper tools, the tasks are easier for you and you protect the plant and the vegetables to come. My grandson Henry was super excited to use my sharp pruner to harvest a sunburst summer squash. That evening, he really appreciated that farm fresh flavor. Gardening with friends and family is a strong motivation for me. There's lots of gear to be had in the garden. Just take a look at the large photo on the top. Row covers, the white tunnels, are helpful for plants at various stages of development. The tunnels are formed by metal hoops driven into the soil. And row cover or row fabric laid on top. And then small little document clips hold that fabric in place on the hoops. After planting, seeds or starts Row covers permit the slow penetration of spring rains and protection from wind and hail. A real positive is that it traps heat and moisture in the tunnel to speed germination and plant growth. The row cover fabric is available in different weights depending on your needs, and it's reusable from year to year with the proper care. I really um, utilize row covers a lot in my garden. The plastic mulch shown in the larger photo is installed just prior to planting. It is rolled out on the prepared garden and secured with earth stakes or staples. I use a scissor to cut an X in the mulch, hold it back, and that's where I plant my starts. Plastic mulch helps with water retention in the soil, trapping heat in the soil for soil loving plants, reduces weed growth, and keeps the squash off the dirt. A word to the wise, with any of the row covers or plastic mulch, it is important to peek under them on a regular basis. They can be a hiding place for broken irrigation lines, as well as pests or or disease. Plants that grow vertically will need some type of support for their best production. Cages, trellises, fences, and poles are the most commonly used. Peas do well on a fence. And an A-frame tre uh, trellis, as seen above, enables vines to grow vertically, and it uses less space in the garden. It's always the best to put in the supports before planting seeds or just prior to planting starts. Wimpy tomato cages should be outlawed. A mature tomato plant can measure more than 36 inches across and 48 inches high as seen in the photo on the right. Last summer, some of my beefsteak tomatoes were over two pounds each. Tomato cages should be big and sturdy to support the plants and the developing fruit. Poles should be driven, driven deep into the soil and secured at the top for strength. Tall enough for climbing plants, but not too tall. When erecting poles and fences, think about harvesting. If they're too tall, then you won't be able to reach the top bounty. But lucky for me, my son, pictured above, is six feet tall and is able to harvest tender green beans eight feet high that I can't reach. As you can see, there are lots of accessories that, you, that can help you in your garden, but just take it one step 
at a time. Step three, determine what vegetables to grow in your space. What are the best plants to grow is my most constant question that I get. And what I like, to, what I like is crisp green beans and warm cherry tomatoes right off the plant. They are the best plants for me to grow and a big motivator. The best vegetables to grow are the ones your family will eat. Now that's motivation. That being said, it's also an opportunity to try new vegetables or the fancy ones that you see at farmer's markets. It's also a fine time to experience how different vegetables grow with your family. The root vegetables, the climbing beans, the wandering pumpkin vines. How about the life cycle of the plant? Seed to plant to flower to fruit to seed. What an opportunity for an academic growth. How much space do you have? Some plants can grow in a small space and even in shallow depth. Other plants will wander and want to sink their roots in deep or reach for the sky. Information on the back of seed packets and seed tags will help. If your garden space does not get six hours of sun, don't give up. That's an opportunity for leafy vegetables that may work well in that space, especially when it gets hot in the summer. Also, what makes good economic sense? Well, I like to grow the vegetables that are most expensive at the farmer's markets and the ones that are best fresh off the plant. Quality, production space, and value were the guiding questions for a study done at Washington State University. They compared a variety of crops for these three attributes in an effort to help home gardeners get the most out of their gardens. This study may help you decide which crops make sense for taste, how much space you have, and the monetary return for your efforts. For example, the edinami highlighted in yellow scored high for quality, medium for space, and high for economic value. If that's a vegetable you would like to try, it might make sense to do that based on the data. On the other hand, potatoes, highlighted in pink, scored low for quality, medium for space, and low for economic value. When choosing vegetables to grow, this chart may be a helpful resource. To develop a plan, first you need to decide on the overall space you have for your garden. Then you're going to divide that space into garden bed space and walkways. Walkways need to be at least 18 inches wide for kneeling and working the garden beds. If you plan to use a wheelbarrow, plan on a wider walkway, maybe 24 to 36 inches wide. Also, your reach into the garden bed shouldn't really be more than about two or three feet from the edge of the walkway so that you can access your plants and take care of things. Cultural needs refers to how you care for your plants. When they are planted together, then you can give them the right amount of water and nutrients appropriate for healthy plants and harvests. They may also want to group plant families to be together. Some vegetables you plant once and they grow all summer long. Other plants can benefit from succession planting. This system allows you to rotate out the cool, early crops as the weather warms. Perhaps replacing snap peas on the fence with cucumber starts that will grow vertically during the heat of the summer. Succession planting also includes replanting seeds for things like herbs and leafy greens that are harvested earlier. 
If you work on about a two week schedule and plant a few seeds every two weeks, then you've got a continual supply of those vegetables. How's that? Crop rotation by family. The most common vegetables can be grouped in just nine plant families. A plant family is a grouping of plants that are similar. Take a look at this list. Some of these vegetable groupings may be familiar to you. Others, surprising. Here's where a garden journal really comes in handy. Keeping track of your crops from year to year. I know I rely on my journal and not my memory. <laughs> Crop rotation is shown in the hand-drawn plan above by changing the plant family location in the garden season to season, you can help prevent disease, pest problems, and loss of nutrients from the soil. As you plan your garden, think about grouping your crops by family and rotating each family into a different space each year, kind of like a new house each year. A four year rotation of crops is optimum. But if space doesn't allow for such a rotation, you have other options to keep things healthy. Growing cover crops in the off season, keeping your garden clear of diseased plant material, and choosing disease resistant plant varieties. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Well then plant a pot of herbs. An herb garden is a great starting part, place for a beginner, a chef, and in an excellent money saver. They can grow easily in a container or be grown in the ground. Ounce for ounce, herbs are one of the most economically sound crops to grow. These were planted from starts purchased at a garden center. Having a pot of herbs can be really rewarding it can create interest on your deck. They're often fragrant and provide culinary delight, both fresh and dried. Many herbs such as thyme, rosemary, sage, and oregano may winter over here in the Willamette Valley. Cilantro can self-seed, dropping seeds that sprout a new generation of herbs. So seeds versus starts, which to grow? Well, the simple answer is, and the reality is you'll probably grow both. An important detail when you are choosing your seeds or starts is to look for the days to harvest. You'll want to find varieties that have a shorter number of days due to our climate and growing season. Check the planting charts and seed packets for recommended growing methods. Some plants just do better and grow more vigorously when seeds are planted directly into the soil. Some plants do better as a start. A start is a young plant that is typically started indoors or in a commercial greenhouse. It is well developed with many true leaves and is showing good potential, but not root bound. Starting starts can be purchased from the garden center or you can plant your seeds at home indoors. There are many advantages to using starts. Starts are less susceptible to pests because they are bigger. And with proper care, bigger plants become established faster. Starts ensure that long season crops get an adequate head start for that number of growing days it needs in order to develop vegetables. Warm crops such as tomatoes, tomatillos, hot peppers, bell peppers, some squash and eggplant should definitely go into the garden as a healthy start sometime after Mother's Day. You know, seed packets and plant labels are a good source of information, but they're kind of generic. So I use three charts to guide and help me plan my vegetable garden throughout the year. 
The first one I got as an intern during my master gardening training. It is geared toward the Willamette Valley. The chart guides you month by month what can be planted outdoors, started indoors, and grown over the winter. I find starting seeds is fun and it makes spring arrive that much faster. Another motivating factor. The second chart is a really good one for the Willamette Valley too. And I like the additional information it offers like that plant footprint and to estimate how much space I'm gonna need for that plant. It also talks about the planting method, rows versus a hill. Did you know that a hill means planting seeds in a grouping and not on a mound? And the last column helps to better understand which crops are best for succession and which are planted just once for the growing season. This final chart is actually two-sided and I like it because it divides the crops into the two categories, cool crops and warm crops. It includes lots of data on soil and air temperature that are necessary for germination of different seeds. So you can see each of the charts provides different kinds of information and it helps in my planning process. Those of you outside of the Willamette Valley, this chart also includes additional regions in Oregon. I'm sure that Sean is providing links for all of these in the chat box, so take a look. Here in Oregon, planting seeds directly outdoors can start as early as February, but it is the soil temperature that is the determining factor that triggers seeds to germinate and grow. If you plant them too early, they'll just sit in the soil and rot. Some seeds really like it cool. Some like it warm. Refer, re, again, refer to the seed labels for details and the crop charts that we just talked about. I always use my soil thermometer before planting anything in the garden. I actually keep hard copies of the charts in my gardening journal and in my seed storage container. While we're talking about seeds, did you know that seeds from previous planting seasons that have been stored properly may still be viable? So you can conduct a little germination test on those seeds before you buy new ones, or you can just buy new ones. Cool season vegetables are also sometimes called early season crops. In general, cool seasons seeds will germinate in a lower soil temperature and the plants will grow best in cooler air temperatures of spring and fall lettuce, onion, parsnip, and spinach will germinate at 35 degrees Fahrenheit soil. Other uh, vegetables will germinate at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And these are some of the crops that are considered cool season crops. Warm season crops need warmer soil and air temperatures to germinate and thrive. Warm crops want a minimum soil temperature in the 50s or 60s and the air temperatures in the 80s and 90s. So that's well past 4th of July here in the Willamette Valley. If you don't have a garden and you plan to use containers, go for it. When you're looking for seeds or starts, look for the label patio varieties. They are often determinant tomato plants that will grow to a certain size, set flowers, set fruit, and not get as big as the ones as I put in the ground. So you really want to consider the mature size of the plant that you put into your container, the sun needs, your personal preference. And if this is going to sit on your deck, why not take advantage of brightly colored foliage? like the Swiss chard in these pictures, or those bright red peppers in that planter. 
add some flowers for interest. Pollinators will love it. Okay, step four, develop and enrich knowledge for your soil, planting, care, maintenance, and harvesting. Be before we prepare the soil, let's look at the components that are in soil. Soil is a combination of 25% air, 25% water, 5% organic matter, and 45% minerals and rock particles. A loamy soil is ideal and would have about 15% sand, silt, and clay. Many of our homes in the Willamette Valley have soil with a lot of clay. Are you feeling, I can feel your pain. <laughs> if your soil is very hard and cracked in the summer and soggy and mushy in the winter, there is a good chance you have a high percentage of clay. Your yard may be a good candidate for a raised garden bed where you can bring in loamy topsoil to provide a good growing environment for your vegetables. You can also explore what's in your soil. This can be really an interesting discovery process, whether you're a new gardener or an experienced gardener. You simply collect some soil from various locations in your garden, place them in a jar with a lid, cover them with water, give it a really, really good shake, add some dish soap, give it another shake, and then just allow it to sit undisturbed for about 45, 48 hours and observe how it stratifies. In this, you can expect the sand layer to form on the bottom, topped by silt, and then topped again by clay. Organic material will be at the very top, might even be floating. Understanding soil pH is important. Most vegetable plants like soil to be in that neutral range 6.2 to 7.5 to absorb nutrients from the water most efficiently. When starting a garden, it is important to test the pH. You can take it to a lab or you can do your own analysis at home with some pH paper that you get online or at a garden center. First, you collect soil from various locations in your garden, place the soil in a clear jar with a lid, add three or more inches of distilled water above that soil, give the jar a good shake, let it sit for at least 30 minutes, and then finally dip the pH strip in the cloudy water and compare the color of the strip to the pH. This year, there will be free pH soil tests at the Spring Garden Fair held over at the Canby Fairgrounds on April 30th and May 1st. So when you go to the fair, bring your little baggie of soil and stop off to see the master gardeners and we can test the pH of your soil. It's highly recommended for gardeners of, gardeners of all experience levels to discover the pH of their soil on a regular basis to maximize growing potential. So when to start working the soil? Some of you may be eager to go out there this afternoon on this sunny, chilly day. On the right is healthy, loamy garden soil. It's loose and crumbles. That's what you're looking for. This is some of the soil that is in my garden. On the left is soil too wet. It forms into a ball and holds its shape. If you work your soil when it is too wet, you will ruin the structure of your soil. You can cause compaction, which means not enough space for the roots and water to infiltrate. If you dig your shovel into the ground and it emerges with the soil all compact and real shiny with an imprint of the shovel, stop. 
it's too wet. If you keep working wet soil, it will go from bad to worse. Always start with the soil squeeze test as seen in the pictures. If you're gonna be growing in containers and garden beds, then you definitely will want to get a good quality growing medium. For containers and new raised beds, mix in a new highly quality potting soil to maximize plant growth, flowering, and vegetable production. These potting mixes have organic matter, minerals, and some pumice for good drainage. This provides an ideal growing medium to anchor the roots and nourish your plants. And it's important to fully hydrate that potting mix before putting it in the container. So what's that look like? Well, I just put the hose right in the bag of soil and I just keep adding water and mixing it, adding water until it is totally saturated. Once it's totally saturated, then I can put it into the garden bed. Is it time yet? Well, here's a checklist. Do the squeeze test. If the soil is too wet, you'll need to wait. Check the soil temperature. Be sure to check the seed packets and plant labels or your growing chart to figure out what seeds you can plant first, second, and third. Do you have the tools you need? Been shopping? Well, I have since January when my catalogs arrived. What transplants will you purchase? Wait a minute. Don't purchase your transplants until the air and the soil are the right temperature. So consult your chart. Feeling motivated? Plant spacing in the garden is really important. What will be the mature size of each plant? That's what you want to keep in mind. If you're short on space, maximize space by gr growing vertically. Peas, beans, cucumber, squash are all good candidates to grow on a fence or on a trellis. Tiny seeds can be very challenging. Using or making your own seed tape can make a difference in your garden. My granddaughter, Katie, made her own seed tape and then planted it. Whether planting starts or seeds for the, uh, the depth, it's, it's important to keep in mind to, to plant them at the proper depth. Sorry. <laughs> and what does that mean is that you want to sow the seeds approximately four times as deep as the longest part of the seed. You can also just follow the directions, but sometimes we lose those packets. Okay, um, most starts are planted. When you plant a start, you will want to plant it at that current soil level that it is in the pot. However, there are some exceptions. Some starts want to be planted deep, like tomatoes. But that's another webinar that's coming up in April. So stay tuned for that. Care and maintenance is where you will spend most of your time and effort. It is referred to as the cultural practices. So let's look at watering. In my household, I try to involve everyone. And on the left, my 15-year-old granddaughter, Emma, all she needed was a step stool and an invitation, and she loves to help water the plants. On the right, my sister, Deb, was housebound and very ill, yet she thrived with the opportunity to plant and care for her containers of vegetables and flowers. Don't ever underestimate the simple joys that the young and the old get from their gardening chores. Drip lines and soaker hoses are irrigation systems that can be installed by the novice gardener. Adding timers are a great time saver. Fewer trips out to the garden. 
However, it's all, you always need to pay attention to the weather and to supplement with extra water during hot spells or even turn it off for a few days when the weather is wet. Water delivered early in the day minimizes evaporation and has increased water absorption by the plant. Watering deep gets the water down to the roots. That's where it has to be so that the plant can utilize it. The goal is to have an evenly moist root zone. To check this, you can dig down six to eight inches after watering to check the soil moisture level. Increase or decrease your watering as necessary. You know, different soils will absorb at different rates. So you'll need to get to know your garden bed soil. Plants need attention. Tasks that keep your garden healthy and, produ and producing include trimming off dead or dying leaves, clipping off bolting blooms on leafy greens, thinning plants, and the removal of cool crops as the season progresses. On the left, you see some nice healthy turnips. When root vegetables start to crowd, gently thin out that monkey in the middle. So I would remove this uh, turnip in the middle to give the other two an opportunity to grow. Also notice how close they are to that, um, that uh, hose, you definitely want to make sure that your seeds are planted near the, the water source. Uh, succession planting means adding more seeds on a regular basis. On the right, I am planting beets late in the summer for a fall harvest. I've pulled the bolting cilantro and I'm using the space for a new crop of beets. When a plant is not looking good, or it has quit producing, it's time to pull it and allow those resources in the soil to go to the remaining plants. Consistently picking outer leaves from the Swiss chard, the larger eggplants in the container, and the ripe tomatoes will urge the plant to continue to grow, produce, and ripen. Plants that grow Seed bearing vegetables like peas, beans, summer squash, eggplant, and tomatoes need to be picked. If you don't pick them, then the plant gets the feeling that, hey, I did my job and I'm going to put my energy into those developing seeds instead of more flowers and more vegetables. When harvesting, you need to uh, give a gentle squeeze to some vegetables to feel that give. And then that tells you that it is time to, uh, that it's ripe and ready to plant, a pick. Vine ripened means exactly that, picked at the peak of perfection. Isn't that what you're looking for? So harvest on a regular basis. Each vegetable has its subtle clues that it's ready to harvest. You may want baby zucchinis for the grill or a large zucchini that you're gonna stuff. Hey, you're the boss of your garden. Just remember to harvest it when you wanna eat it. Lastly, I can't stress enough, using the correct tools to harvest will also preserve the health and the plant for future harvests. Pests come in all shapes and sizes. Looking for clues is the first step to integrated pest management. And please always identify and monitor problems before acting and consider the least toxic approach first. When using chemicals for insects or disease control, follow recommendations on the labels and store those chemicals safely out of the reach of children and your pets. In many cases, in a vegetable garden, it's not a pest. 
but the cultural practices or what you're doing in your garden. So really think about what would be best for your garden. Weather, like hail, also has been mistaken as insect damage. So think about what's been happening in the weather. Therefore, it's really important to look carefully at your plants for signs of specific pests before using a pesticide. After all, these are your vegetables and you have control over what chemicals go in there. If you see holes in a slime trail, well, then it is a good chance that you've got slugs and, snail, uh, slugs and snails in your garden. With a flashlight in hand, well, you can go and pick them off at night because that's when uh, slugs and snails are most active. Slugs love those leafy vegetables. Learn about the life cycle of pests and try to interrupt the offspring that will do the damage. Depending on the size of your garden and the outbreak, physical removal of, or the simply squishing those eggs on the cabbage worm will slow down the damage phase of its life. White flies can really make a mess of a garden. Physical removing with bursts of water or an herbicidal soap solution can slow them down. Or sometimes you just need to remove those leaves that are, have the infestation. Mammals and birds can do a lot of damage and quickly. Who hasn't had a deer wander in and taken down the better part of a row of peas or beans? Barriers and nets are some of your best defenses against those critters. I know I had some crows sitting in the tree right above my garden bed this weekend. My soil had reached 45 degrees and it was well time to plant peas. I was diligent to place row covers on my raised bed to give those seeds a fighting chance. So here's the game plan for success. You've got the careful preparations and you've got the consistent care. I've presented a lot of information today because there's a lot to do in a garden, no matter what the size. And when things get rough and you're feeling discouraged, remember and embrace the seed of motivation that started you on this journey with your vegetable gardening. Please explore the many resources of 10 Minute University, including videos and over 50 handouts on a variety of gardening needs. Listed here are the ones that have specific instructions, details, and helpful science-based information to help your garden be more successful. This presentation has been recorded and it will be available in a few days, so check your emails. So now I'd like to welcome Cheryl, my co-host today, and she will facilitate uh, the question and answers. Hi, Priscilla. <clears throat> Great presentation. And I must say, when you uh, started talking about mammals and other pests that uh, damage a garden, you had many people perk up in the chat to say they shared losing their whole row of peas to, <laughs> to a mammal. Oh, yeah. That was in their garden. That happens. It happens all the time. And yeah. really the only way is a complete eight foot fence around your entire space and not always possible. Not always possible, but worth the effort because it might keep some of them out. It, indeed. We've all tried various tricks. Um, there was one cute remark that we received from one lady who said she had a friend who lived to be 104 and her practice every year to keep slugs from her garden was to put 10 inch wide planks down for her rows to walk on and every morning she turned them over and picked off all the slugs that collected on the underside not a bad idea <laughs> yep and that's one of the drawbacks of that plastic mulch it is a place that uh that slugs will uh inhabit especially if it's not too hot right we did get some questions about irrigation. I thought you were very, very clear on various ways to irrigate your garden. And I know we do not recommend a particular type of irrigation for your garden. But would you say if you had a 10 by 10 foot garden space, you could probably hand water or irrigate with soaker hoses. Uh, but if you have a larger space, you might have another consideration. 
Yeah, you know, it's always best to keep the water off the leaves of the plants whenever possible. And so I, I think that drip systems have really come a long way for the novice gardener with lots of instructions. So um, a drip system, I have been successful with soaker hoses for many years now. I'm not really gonna change it. And um, just the wide dip, drip hoses. Uh, it's very important that you have them deliver a consistent amount of water, you know, um, not just turning it on and off on a, on a whim because when your plants aren't getting a consistent amount of water, they are more prone to disease and they kind of can, can even go into shock. Does that answer that? That's a very good, that's a very good answer. Um, the best substance for your bed pads, um, this, this individual wants something that's somewhat attractive, but she would like to keep the weeds suppressed and keep her vegetables happy as well. Okay, one thing that we use in the Master Gardener is we, in the Master Gardener community is we get um, burlap bags. And we lay those burlap bags down. And in my particular instance, I just keep putting layer after layer because I'm in the community garden. But um, I've seen wood chips go on top of those. Um, be a little careful of your source so that you're not getting diseased materials into your garden area. Um, I like stepping stones. If you um, put those down, I've also seen river rocks be very effective as stepping as a, um, an area. I don't recommend grass just because it becomes invasive and it will radiate in towards your garden beds where there's all those good nutrients and water. Um, sand, uh, if you live near the coast, I've seen some very attractive gardens with uh, shells. So if you have access to shells, that can also be a really nice garden path. Um, great idea. That's actually a great idea if you lived on the coast. Um, mm -hmm. We just got a little question in here about squash. Is, in your experience, uh, is there a squash variety that you can be trellised if you have a limited amount of space and you really wanna go up with your squash? Yes, I have grown um, that sunburst summer squash on a trellis. The, the little tendrils will grab on and climb up. And the, I usually plant, uh, harvest those squash when they are about the size of a baseball, not much bigger. And therefore that's really helpful on a trellis because there's not a lot of weight and it may not get knocked off. And, um, it's a really good advantage to put it up on a trellis because then you keep the, the ground critters away from either nibbling on it or sliming it or any of those, those yeah, hazards. <laughs> and also it gets a lot more air circulation on the leaves. So you get less powdery mildew issues if you keep those leaves dry. Good point. Another question. I read somewhere, this, uh, this person says, I read somewhere that when you're having a really hot day, it's okay to overhead water your plants to cool them off and also allow the moisture to enter the plants through the leaves. Is that still recommended? Well, what do you think on that? <laughs> I, I have been known to do such a thing. Um, I have too. But I always am, uh, I don't like to give that advice to others only because I, if I have chosen to overhead water and I develop powdery mildew or some other problem because I chose to do that. I guess I have to live with myself. Um, I don't know that I could say it's recommended. Um, my I think is, that um, if you've got a really hot day, then that's one of those days when you're going to have to supplement with um, more watering, maybe watering in the morning and then coming back in the afternoon, say early afternoon, say around two o'clock so that, right. um, that the, um, the plant is getting as much of the water down in its roots. So nice deep waterings twice a day versus, but I have been known to do that. I'm not sure if there's any, I don't think there's any science to support that. I would agree. I've not spread any science to support it. And if you keep the soil, the root zone hydrated, the leaves will, they may get kind of crisp on the edges, but they will survive it. So yeah, um, I also will put down a nice layer of mulch on my, um, 
warm crops. And that also helps to keep the moisture down there. And they seem to have less shock when we get one of those hot days. Um, I had cocoa fiber mulch on top on over all my uh, tomatoes last year. And when we had that uh, heat dome come in, my plants fared pretty well. I was, I was thrilled. That is really excellent to hear. And let's just hope we don't have another um, heat dome. Yeah. Uh, um, and that brings me to this, a garden journal. You talked about a garden journal and I'm assuming that you kind of keep a pretty thorough one. So you know how long things have been planted in a certain area for crop rotation. And um, do, tell me how, about a little bit about your journal. Do you just, do you keep an actual journal? Do you just write it down, notes down? Do you, how do you do that? Because I'm really bad about that. I am bad about that. And I wish, and I, particularly with the heat bubble we had last summer, it would be very valuable to me if I kept notes on all of that. Yeah. Um, let's see. I keep my information on two places. I, ha I have an old fashioned calendar that is on my refrigerator. So when I do something, I will jot that down quickly and then transfer that information into my journal. If I happen to have my journal at the garden, then I actually take it a time for some real personal time to, to make observations. So keeping your journal in a spot where you can access it on a regular basis and at your garden is gonna be really helpful. Some people I know keep it in their greenhouse. So then they grab it out of their greenhouse, go out to the garden. Um, so mine is very chronological. So it, you know, it's almost like keeping a, a diary. Um, that's how I have my information in there. And then um, I will also put um, articles that I find interesting a lot. The Oregonian has some really fun gardening articles on Saturday mornings. So I will cut out those articles and glue them in my journal. And then I have access to those because if I just stick them in a pile, I, I can never find them. If they're not all in one place, you won't ever yeah. find them again. And, and my journal isn't fancy. It's just a, a three ring binder that I bought from uh, the, the store. And uh, I, I do put it into a zip bag. So it's gets it's some protection waterproof. from dirt and water. It's still a little bit messy, but it's okay. It's good enough. It's right. Well, if you can read it and it mean refer to it, I think that's great. And it, definitely water is an issue. I mean, if I took it out in the garden, totally that'd be a problem. It definitely my garden layout um, for each of my garden beds is um, roughly sketched out, kind of like the one that you saw in the, uh, the presentation, just hand drawn and uh, labeling what plants were in there, the variety, uh, because sometimes there's a variety that doesn't do well. Well, chances are I might buy it again, unless I look back in my journal and then I remember, ah, oh, that didn't work out. Right, well, you've really done a good job of it. And I think a garden journal is a valuable resource for all of us. And you know what? We're just about out of time and you've answered all the questions. Great job. Look forward to the next one. Yeah, we're, we're enjoying these noontime chats. We uh, thank you for uh, registering. Uh, as I said, it will be record. it has been recorded and you will have access to it at a, um, hopefully an email will be coming your way in case you wanna get back to some of those charts or pictures or listen to some of the details. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Cheryl. Bye, thanks Priscilla. Bye.